the wall of authoritarianism. How democracies can prevent the slow decline into autocracies. Lilia Moritz Schwarz, University of Sao Paulo. On November 9, 1989, I was giving a bath to my son and thought the whole world was falling apart. Good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here talking about this topic that is so urgent in our common agenda. So let me start with a question. How, how can we transform democracy? How democracy can be transformed in autocracy? I'm talking about new governments that are based on coup d'etat. I'm not speaking about traditional coup d'etat from the 60s, the coup d'etat with tanks and soldiers in the streets. I'm talking about silent and daily coup d'etat. I'm talking about new governments elected by no normal means then start to attack democratic institutions. And at the same time, they start to build what I call pavement, the pavement to autocracy. Authoritarianism always comes with the increment of racial hits and attacks. So as I cannot talk about various countries, let me talk about Brazil, the country where I live and the country where I teach. Brazil is a, ver a very paradoxical case if you think about racial question. Brazil was the last country to abolish the slave system just on May 1888. Brazil was the country that kidnapped most people from Africa. And Brazil had enslaved all over the country. That created a kind of silent language, a language of inequality, a language of difference. But that's not just in the past, because nowadays in Brazil, we, are, we experience a kind of structural racism. It means that Racism structures, health, education, public transportation, and public representation. If you go to the United States, you can say that the black population represents 13 to 16 percent of the total population. In Brazil, black populations correspond to 56.4 of the whole population. So we are not talking about a minority. We are talking about a major minority in representation. But Brazilians love to describe themselves in the country as a melting pot, a racial democracy. So during the year of the centenary of the abolition of the slave system in Brazil, in 1989, we organized at the University of Sao Paulo a project research that would try to understand patterns of exclusion. We three questions. First question, do you have prejudice? 95% of the answers, no. Second question, do you know a person that has prejudice? 99% of the answers, yes. <laughs> and third question is who said, yes, try to describe the relationship you have with this person. We didn't ask for names, but people wanted to give names and wanted to say things like this, my husband, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, it's terrible. So the informal conclusion of this research is that every Brazilian thinks he or she is 
an island of racial democracy surrounded by racists everywhere. <laughs> Not by coincidence, during the military regime that started in 1964, the biggest message was Brazil is a racial democracy. That was a long way that we had for redemocratization. In 1988, Brazil had a new constitution, the Citizenship Constitutions, that explained to us that to have a good republic, you need, we need vigilant citizenships. Brazil had 30 years of a plain democracy, but then suddenly, in 2016, the world experience, really a terrible economic recession, and new regressive governors started to appear in the agenda of countries like the United States, Turkey, Hungary, and Brazil. In 2018, Brazil elected Jair Bolsonaro, that loved to describe himself as a digital populist, that he really is, and an anti-system president, that he is not. Bolsonaro was, in, was, was a very misogynist and racist congre ordinary congressman for more than 27 years. He and his family were in power for a long time. And then, for four years, Jair Bolsonaro started to attack the press, mainly women, journalists, attack academic and scientific institutions, attack democratic institutions, promoted the arming of the civil population, and crea he created an atmosphere of intimidation and coercion transforming adversaries that are very good for democracy in enemies. Brazil had more than 600,000 of victims of COVID, mainly because of negationism, scientific negationism. Brazil is a very unequal country, historically unequal. We are the sixth most unequal country in the world. And inequality has big impacts in education. The best schools are private in Brazil. In health, now we know that the majority of the victims of the pandemic in Brazil were black, poor, and used to live in the peripheries of our big towns. Hunger is back to Brazil after 10 years. And environment, it's very much attacked. In this government, Amazon was attacked 63% more than during former government. But let me go back to my main topic, race, and add the word silence. Of course, I do not believe in biological race, but I really believe in social race. This is the way society creates difference using color as a social marker of difference. I already talked about major minorities, but let me include another topic, the whitening social process in Brazil. I want to go back in history. In 1911, Brazil was the only country to be invited to take part of the Universal Congress of Races. The Brazilian delegate, João Batista Lacerda, presented a thesis, sur métis, that in three generations, Brazilians would be white, Greeks maybe, he said. Then he presented this canvas. On the left side, let us read this image. On the left side, you can see a grandmother. He raises her hand as a miracle had happened in that moment, the miracle of whitening. On the right side, you see a white man, a foreigner, maybe a Portuguese, 
and he looks proudly to the center of the painting. Then you see a woman, the mother. She is whiter than her mother, and she has a baby on her lap. And the baby is white, has straight hair, and blue eyes. <laughs> Let me tell you and talk about another detail. The grandmother steps on the floor. She is barefoot. The father steps on a pavement floor. And the mother is in between. But pay attention. The mother and the son are pointing to the future. So let us go now to another image from 2019, a propaganda from the Minister of Education and Culture. You can see a black lady smiling because she achieved a dream entering the university. But there is something strange in this photograph. Did you notice? <laughs> Note the yes, <laughs> that her left arm is black. And again, is pointing to the straw. And the right arm is white. This is the one that has the straw. Now, in slow motion, <laughs> we are talking about processes, official processes of erasure, official processes of whitening in a country that the majority is black. But let me start finishing this presentation. Why is the case of Brazil so crucial? So I'm going to start giving you five principles of decline for other democracies to learn from. First, personalism. The president of Brazil likes to be called myth. And in a republic, it's better to have a president and to have a social contract. Denialism. We live in a world of fake news. And we really need good information and science to have a better democracy. Weakening democratic institutions. Republic is based in equally independent institutions, powers. Polarization. Since the Greeks, we know that politics is the art of building consensus. Patrimonialism. The state is not a private house, so we cannot mixture public and private spheres. Let us make a fact here. We have to take care of democracy. Democracy is an incomplete regime by definition. This is the beauty and the challenge of democracy. The beauty because we always have to create and recreate democracy. The challenge because civil rights are never gained forever. We have to conquer again and again. So, we are dealing in times of insecurity, not just in Brazil. And I want to finish with the good of Tokyo. Let's make a fact for democracy. In Brazil, on 30 October, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva was elected for the third time as a president. Lula was the seventh son of a poor family that came from Northeast, an literary family. He is a metal worker, a trade unionist. And I'm not saying that that's the end of the story. <laughs> that's the beginning of the story. I'm not saying that Brazilians are going to live forever and ever, happy forever and democratically. No. But we have a new dream now. We have a new thing to face. So allow me to finish my presentation with a beautiful quotation for, with, that comes from a very classical book in Brazil. Grande Sertão Veredas by João Guimarães Rosa. 
allowed me to read it in Portuguese for you to give a <coughs> sense of this. And then you can follow me in English. O correr da vida embrulha tudo. A vida é assim. Esquenta e afrocha. Aperta e daí. Aperta e daí afrocha. Sossega e depois desinquieta. O que ela quer da gente é coragem. In this day, November 9th, we have to remember people that were very courageous in the past. You have, we have to be courageous. Courageous for everyone and everywhere. Thank you very much.